Hello everyone, welcome to the DNC Space webinar where you can send your DNA experiment to the space station. I hope uh, everyone is excited about this opportunity uh, to send your, your very own uh, DNA experiment to the International Space Station. We are very excited to be here sharing details about the Genes in Space competition with you. Some of you uh, have been involved with Genes in Space for some time. Some of you may be new to Genes in Space. So we hope to, with this webinar, to bring you all up to speed um, on how to submit a, a good and winning proposal for, for the Genes in Space competition. Um, today, uh, we'll uh, you know, introduce ourselves and then we want you to walk away from this webinar knowing very well what um, PCR technology is. PCR technology is a technology that is aboard the International Space Station and the one that you are going to be using to design your experiment. We will tell you uh, what it is, we will tell you how we use it on Earth today, um, and we will uh, try to help you think about how you can use it uh, in space. And we will also tell you uh, all about the Genes in Space competition, um, what it involves, how it works, um, what resources are available for you, and we hope to help you uh, answer any questions you have about how to submit a proposal. At the end, we will have uh, five or ten minutes for questions, uh, so if you have any questions, please hold them until the end, and you can let us know either by the phone or preferably by the chat on the webinar if you're logged in. Um, I want to say before we go on that um, we will be at the UAE uh, in Abu Dhabi in August 22nd um, doing a hands-on real uh, no, live workshop uh, for anyone that is interested. So if you are interested in participating uh, in that workshop, please um, email um, email us or let us know um, and we will send you additional information. Um, one more thing, we're going to reopen the submissions for the Genes in Space competition. For some of you have already submitted, you will have a chance to uh, modify if you'd like that submission. Um, and for the people that are new, you will have a chance to submit a, a new application. Um, so, uh, I'm Zeke speaking today first here. I'm part of the Genes in Space uh, team. I'm together uh, with Sebastian and Mugda. Myself, I'm a geneticist trained at MIT, and I'm one of the co-founders of MiniPCR. Uh, MiniPCR is a technology that is now available at the space station, um, and it's, a, it's a, essentially a miniature PCR machine, which is the technology we'll be talking about today, that we have developed over the past few years. Sebastian Kravitz is another co-founder of MiniPCR. He's it's a PhD, has a PhD in neurobiology from Harvard University. Um, and Mugda uh, Narasimhan is also here with us from uh, coming from the Harvard Business School, and she's a MiniPCR chief experience officer. Uh, some of you may have already heard uh, directly from Mugda throughout um, the first phase of the Genes in Space competition. Um, so we'll all be talking to you today. Um, and you no, know, uh, you are free to ask anyone a question at the end, and to contact us after the webinar. So let's let's uh, get started with uh, with the program. So um, we've been studying DNA and studying space for quite some time now, and there are pa parallels between the two. Um, you know, DNA is a, is a small, it's small, it's tiny. It's inside a cell. It's inside. Um, it's inside the nucleus of that cell, and it's wrapped up in a chromosome. So it's, it's sort of inaccessible. It's very hard to study if we um, we don't have the right tools. And you now today we will show you what are the tools to study DNA. And when we think about studying you know, space or stars or planets or galaxies, um, at night we can we can see them from from far away. But if we want to study them in more detail, we need special tools. And you know, today we use uh, telescopes on Earth or telescopes um, like the Hubble that are uh, closer to them. Um, so 
we need tools. We need special tools to study. And let's move on to what tools do we need to study uh, DNA. And the, the gold standard for DNA analysis is a tool called PCR. And it stands for the polymerase chain reaction. And in very simple terms, what PCR does, it allows anyone to search an entire genome, if necessary, um, for a very specific region, the region that they are interested in studying, and make physical copies, millions and millions of copies of that DNA in a very short amount of time. This is similar to putting uh, you know, a page of a book in a photocopier and getting you know, hundreds or thousands of copies, physical copies of that uh, page. So you will end up with a stack of paper. In the case of DNA, you will end up with many, many molecules of DNA. And that is what enables someone to actually visualize the DNA or study it in other ways. Um, PCR is at the heart of DNA technology. And so what do we use DNA technology or PCR for uh, today on Earth? Um, and pretty much any time you, you hear about DNA, someone has done PCR um, in order to be able to analyze that. So, for example, molecular diagnostics. If someone uh, is infected with Ebola or Zika virus has been in the news uh, lately, um, how can we detect that in someone's um, blood, for example? Well, the first step is to use PCR to try to make copies of that virus. Um, Someone might, might ask, am I predisposed to developing a genetic disease uh, such as breast cancer or many others? Um, that is a question we can also answer using PCR. We can make copies of the gene in question and you know, read it so that we know more about the gene. Uh, when we talk about evolution, uh, can we determine you know, how species are related to each other or even how people are related to each other? Again. That's another uh, time where we use uh, PCR and DNA analysis for. It's uh, the tool of choice in forensics. Uh, no, the best evidence usually comes from DNA analysis in forensics, and it allows us to you know, distinguish between people, and you know, it's often the evidence that can put someone in jail or can get them out of jail. We use DNA analysis a lot also in food and agriculture. We modify our foods to make them more resistant to drought, or to pests or to insecticides. Um, and more and more, you know, DNA is becoming more available, it's cheaper to use, so we can learn a lot more about ourselves by using DNA analysis. So all these are you know, real world examples that are being used today um, with DNA analysis. And at the heart of this, as I said, is PCR. So PCR is extremely powerful in, in that it allows us to, um, it's that telescope that allows us to, to look inside the DNA and, and find uh, you know, its code and what it stands for. So let me move into you know, what, how exactly PCR works and you know, what, what is, how, how do we start with one copy and end up with millions of copies. So, um, there are three steps for PCR, and the first one is uh, to uh, take that double-stranded DNA, and many of you have probably seen uh, in, in a textbook a double-stranded DNA um, that is, is sort of a spiral. So um, our first step in, in PCR is to actually um, take those two strands apart. Uh, the two strands contain complementary information. Um, and the, 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 the first, the, the way to take them apart is to heat those strands. And when you heat them, you break the bonds that are holding the two strands together without breaking the actual strands of DNA. Um, so now we sort of have two open, uh, no, it's like opening the book. We have two open uh, strands, and um, we can proceed on to finding uh, the piece of DNA that we uh, want uh, to analyze. So we move on to a second step, which we call annealing. Um, and what happens is that in that step, we add uh, 
primers. And you can see in the screen primer 1 and primer 2. These are small sequences, small bits of DNA that mark the beginning and the end of the region that we want to copy. And when we lower the temperature, um, so for denaturation, um, you know, we go to a very high temperature, 94 degrees Celsius, which is almost a boiling point of water. And now, during the annealing step, we're going to reduce that temperature to uh, anywhere between 50 and 60 degrees. So what happens there is that the DNA strands will tend to come back together. But if we add these primers, these primers will tend to find um, the complementary sequences, the sequences that match uh, faster. Um, so they allow us to mark the DNA, the beginning and the end of the DNA that we want to copy. And then we go on to a third step, which is at an intermediate temperature, about 72 degrees Celsius. I have no idea what time it is. And what happens here is that we add um, a DNA polymerase in the tube. Um, and a DNA polymerase is an enzyme that we, every one of us has in our bodies that is specialized in copying DNA. Every time our cells divide, they need to copy the entire genome, which in humans is about 3 billion letters. So these DNA polymerases are experts in copying DNA. They can do it very fast, and they can do it very accurately. So the DNA polymerase that we add to the PCR is a special DNA polymerase called TAC. It comes from an organism that lives at uh, high temperatures. And that's why it can uh, withstand the temperatures uh, from 94 to 72 to 50 that are involved in PCR. Once they see a primer bound to a strand of DNA, these polymerases activate at about 72 degrees Celsius and copy the strands um, that are um, attached to the primer. So by going through a cycle of denaturing, annealing, and extension, uh, we can essentially go from one double strand of DNA to two double strands of DNA of interest. So we went from one copy to two copies. So um, we have two copies now, but that is not enough to actually uh, analyze DNA. We need millions of copies uh, in order to be able to look at DNA. So what we do is we repeat those uh, cycles of heating and cooling. So uh, to put it all again in, in context, we start with a, maybe a single molecule or a few molecules. Um, we first find the DNA of interest, and we copy it once. And then we repeat the cycle. So after that extension step where we copy, we heat again the sample up to 94 degrees Celsius, where we open the strands again, and then we cool, and then we copy. So. Um, now we go from one copy to two copies, and then we go from two to four, because those two strands have, uh, those two DNA molecules have four strands, and then we go from four to eight, to 16, to 32, to, uh, and on and on. And if we do that 30 times, two to the 30 is about a billion. So this is an extremely powerful technology that allows us to you know, take a single molecule and go to a billion molecules in about an hour. Um, so now that we have a billion molecules, we are um, set to be able to analyze that DNA. And this DNA can be analyzed in a few different ways. Um, one way is to actually decode the DNA or sequence it to learn the exact um, letters, A, T, Cs, and Gs that are in DNA. Um, another way is to look at the size of DNA, which is done by gel electrophoresis. So these are the two most common ways of, of uh, you know, revealing what DNA has to tell us. Uh, so, um, you know, PCR machines uh, help us uh, do PCR. So if, if you can imagine this process, um, everything or all your reagents are inside a plastic tube. You put your DNA, you put your primers, you put your enzyme, and you put the letters that make DNA, the A, T, Cs, and Gs, so that you can copy them. Um, and if you think uh, abstractly of what I told you, you we really are uh, heating and cooling that tube uh, through three different steps, 94, uh, 72, and 50 to 60. So 
if you could move that tube between these temperatures, um, you essentially can do PCR. So in the very early days, it, um, people used three water baths at these different temperatures, the annealing, denaturing, and extension temperature. And that was sort of a manual PCR machine. Um, since then, um, we have uh, made machines that have a block of metal that can change the temperature very rapidly. Um, so we can program them, we can tell them what temperatures to go to and how long they have to stay at each stage. And essentially, we can put a tube, walk away, and when we come back an hour later, we will have a billion copies of DNA. So this process works very well in the lab or in the hospital. Um, I know researchers can, can do this. They can put the tube and walk away. But what we want to learn about DNA, um, it becomes a bit tricky to use these machines because um, uh, they don't show us what's happening and they're essentially a black box. So at mini-PCR, what we've done is we re-engineered this machine to make it simpler, to make it less expensive, to make it uh, more approachable um, and more portable. So what you have in this uh, graphic is sort of the inside of uh, a mini PCR machine. And you know, starting uh, from the bottom up, we have um, uh, the, the green plaque is um, uh, the electronics, which will control this process. Then we go one step up and we have those two black squares. Those are fans, and we use fans for cooling. And then if we go up to the next level, we have um, a, a, a plastic uh, part with a block of metal inside that has eight holes. That is where our samples go in, and attached to that is something you can't see. It's a heater. It's a very thin heater. So between that heater and the fans, we can you know, accurately change the temperature of a reaction, and we essentially have a PCR machine. And at the very top, we have a lid, a lid that is, has a heater also, and that prevents condensation of the sample in the top of the tube. Um, so these are sort of the inside of a mini PCR machine. Um, and when you close that up, you have what you see in the center of that picture. It's a very tiny instrument um, that you can now use in many different uh, settings. So um, today, I'll give you a few examples of where uh, mini-PCR is actually being used. Um, and just to give you an idea of what happens when you take a technology that is you know, usually a very big and bulky and expensive technology and put it in the hands of, of more people. So um, I will skip the part about the space station. We're going to talk about it uh, more at length now. But I'll tell you um, about uh, the other cases. So for example, um, these pictures are from um, Sierra Leone. And uh, two years ago, there was a big outbreak of Ebola there. Um, and people were having a hard time you know, diagnosing Ebola and, and tracing the virus to see how it changed over time. So a doctor from the UK, uh, Dr. Ian Goodfellow, um, traveled to McKinney to help uh, with this outbreak. And in order to be able to, uh, to do this analysis, he took um, a mini PCR. Um, and in spite of having very expensive equipment there, um, because of the conditions of um, no poor electricity um, and not having a temperature controlled room, uh, he couldn't use that expensive equipment. And he ended up using mini PCR for all of his analysis. Um, in fact, when he left, he actually uh, got more mini PCR machines and he set up a lab for the local people to be able to continue uh, to do uh, Ebola uh, analysis. Um, so this is something no, it's one example of something you couldn't do with uh, equipment that you can't transport and that is uh, difficult to use. And so here is a very different example. This is a researcher uh, from Yale that studies lemurs in Madagascar. And uh, if, you, if you have a good picture uh, in front of you um, through the computer, you can see at the, at the, on the left picture of the background, there are some lemurs walking around. And, um, these lemurs are endangered, and um, 
this researcher is trying to study you know, their population to see how uh, she can help. And she needs to study the DNA of the population to see how diverse it is. And um, before she couldn't do any, any sort of DNA analysis, by taking the mini-PCR and using it with a battery and a solar panel, she can amplify the whole genome of these lemurs and then bring them back to Yale for further analysis. Um, this is something that wasn't possible before and that was enabled um, by the mini-PCR machine or technology. So you know, these are two examples. And um, you know, there are more places where you can think uh, a small, uh, easier to use technology might be helpful. Um, and you now I said we have other examples, but the one that concerns us today is we we can and we actually as of April we have mini PCR technology in the space station. Um, so now that I gave you a bit of a flavor of you know what we use PCR on Earth, um, and you no know, I've told you we have it on the space station. We can start thinking of um, how could we use uh, this sort of DNA technology. Um, in the space station to, you know, either for, uh, you know, looking at astronauts' health or thinking about exploration beyond Earth. Um, so I want to now uh, turn over uh, the microphone to Sebastian Kravitz, who will um, go into the, the second part of the webinar and talk to you about, um, you know, genes in space more in detail and what we can do with it. Uh, in space. Thanks very much, Zeke. Thanks, everyone. Um, PCR has transformed our world over the past 30 years, and now we're inviting you to join us in exploring DNA beyond Earth. Um, and the place where we're going to be part of this adventure of discovery is the International Space Station. The International Space Station is a feat of human engineering. It's an uh, um, aircraft, a spacecraft, that is orbiting Earth 250 miles high, and it's been permanently inhabited for the last 15 years. This is an unprecedented feat of engineering. And not only is it home to a host of uh, space and engineering uh, research uh, experiments, it's also uh, home to a U.S. national laboratory that conducts hundreds of ongoing investigations across disciplines. And it's permanently inhabited by international crews of up to six or seven uh, astronauts who, who spend, um, you know, stays of various durations from uh, a few weeks to several months to up to a year, as in the case of Scott Kelly recently uh, returning from, from a year in space. So over the last uh, 15 years, Lots of new research capabilities have been added uh, inside the spacecraft, the size of a football field. But uh, we're, we're going one step further, and we want you to join us in DNA exploration uh, above space. But first, a little bit of, of, of context about what it's like uh, to experience space and to experiment in space. Space offers unique uh, challenges and, and unique capabilities where even the most fundamental processes, uh, physical processes even, behave differently than what we're used to on Earth. I mean, here on Earth, anyone has uh, seen a flame glow or, uh, you know, a fire or a candle. Well, even combustion, even fire behaves differently in microgravity than it would here uh, inside the Earth's atmosphere. Um, the growth of crystals, which are fundamental for understanding uh, proteins and, and their structure and the way uh, our bodies are made and our enzymes function, uh, grow differently on, on uh, the International Space Station. We can actually grow uh, perfect crystals unimpeded by, by gravity. Uh, liquid dynamics, fluid dynamics uh, are different, so there are a lot of very basic fundamental differences that one has to take into consideration and that open up uh, very interesting questions. When we, when we first started thinking about replicating DNA in space and up until uh, last April when we conducted the first DNA replication in, in a test tube in space, we, we didn't even know whether 
the polymerases and the machinery that Zeke has just described that is fundamental to DNA replication in PCR would even uh, behave the same way. So not only are just the basic physical chemical properties uh, of, of, of things altered in, in microgravity, but this obviously also affects uh, whole organisms and living things, such as humans and other living things that have been flown to space, uh, ranging from microbes to, to plants. And if humans are really serious about uh, exploring deep space and about possibly colonizing other worlds, uh, setting up colonies on Mars, we really want to understand these changes. We really want to understand how human physiology, uh, how plant physiology, animal physiology are affected. We, after all, have evolved over uh, billions of years of life on Earth and have been under natural selection in an environment that has an atmosphere and, and gravity as hallmarks. And we're talking about moving into very different environments without the protection of an atmosphere and without uh, gravity that we have on Earth. So it's really essential uh, for us humans interested in space exploration to understand how these changes affect um, space travelers. And we want to do that not only at the level of whole organisms. So how is my uh, vision uh, impaired? You know, if you've been reading up on uh, Scott Kelly's year in space, you know that part of it wasn't that fun. There are very fundamental changes in his organ systems. Uh, he even grew taller. Um, so bone density changes, uh, vision, eyesight changes, cardiovascular changes. Uh, in order to really get to understand those changes on a fundamental level, we need to look at the whole organism, but also look at the cells of that organism, and that's why there are tissue culture capabilities above the International Space Station, but even get one layer deeper into the fundamental molecules uh, that make uh, us human, uh, and, and among those molecules, uh, perhaps the most fundamental is DNA. It's fascinating to look at the history of, of space exploration and DNA exploration, and that's sort of where we started this conversation, uh, with an image of the sky and the image of the molecule of DNA buried inside the nucleus of a cell. And these are some of the most exciting challenges humans have ever set out to discover. And if you look at the timeline of the history of space exploration and DNA exploration, you see this amazing parallel. Both Explorations start in earnest in the 1950s. In space, with the launch of the first satellites that orbited Earth and the launch of the, face, uh, of the first humans into spaceflight, um, and DNA with the description uh, or discovery of the DNA double helix, the fundamental structure of base pairs that makes up uh, our genetic material by Watson and Crick. Now, Looking uh, a couple decades in, in the 1980s, facilitated by the uh, U.S. shuttle program, we had the first untethered humans spacewalking, uh, you know, in, 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 in sheer space. Uh, and at the same time, we were making amazing strides in our uh, ability to explore DNA, and PCR was actually uh, invented in, in the 1980s. Fast forward now to our current day and age, and we have visited every planet in the solar system, and, and we have also decoded every base pair in the human genome. So it's really fascinating to see uh, these two parallel histories, and more exciting to look at the time we are now where these two technologies are converging, and we are building the ability to explore genetics, explore DNA and, and genomes in space as we travel deeper into the cosmos. So we're very lucky to be living at a time when uh, the genetics toolkit is becoming available for space explorers above the International Space Station. And we've described mini PCR and PCR technology in general, and that's one of the most recent additions to this research toolkit. At the end of the presentation, we'll share some resources where you can see what other capabilities, research capabilities exist aboard the International Space Station National Lab. 
Uh, but um, just wanted to pause here on, on a couple of them. Uh, together with Mini PCR, now Wet Lab 2 uh, has become available. That is a slightly different uh, PCR technology that uses fluorescence detection. And, and very soon, uh, we're going to hear about, uh, hopefully, results from the MinION sequencer having been sent to the International Space, Space Station. So uh, the hope is that as the, these, these tools build up uh, aboard the National Lab, uh, more and more of the questions that are fundamental to exploring space are going are gonna to start to get uh, easier to study, questions such as, you know, is, is there life beyond Earth, and, and how do we protect the lives of astronauts, and so on. Um, so, you know, as, as these tools become available, hopefully, uh, you know, more of these questions are going to be addressable on orbit. And, and we're inviting you to make use of any PCR technology to help answer some of these questions. So we're really uh, excited to invite you to join in this era of DNA exploration in, in, in space. And I think uh, all of you know this already. But ideas uh, will open for submission online at genesinspace.org. There is a uh, dedicated tab for the UAE contest. The contest is, is currently on hold. Uh, we're, we're working with all of you through this webinar and the upcoming hands-on workshop uh, to help you put your best foot forward and, and, and together understand the technology that's scored to the competition. And uh, we will m announce very soon when submissions reopen. And uh, not only new participants will be invited to submit, but also uh, ongoing and current participants will be invited to bolster their submissions and tweak it if they, if they so wish. So what are some of the questions that uh, you know, participants have been interested in throughout Genes in Space? Um, and so we, we have run a similar competition in the United States that is now on its uh, second year. And, and, and of course, we're mostly interested in the original questions that all of you are going to come up with. But uh, just to share some examples of the types of questions that, ha that have come up from hundreds of participants here in the U.S., um, students have been interested in um, how does cosmic radiation impact the genetic material of astronauts? Does it affect um, our, our genetic code on a, on a chemical level? Um, microbial monitoring, what types of microorganisms uh, share the International Space Station habitat with, with astronauts? Are there uh, any particularly harmful? How can we more, more effectively monitor that environment? Um, bio, bioengineering and microgravity, can we use biotechnology to develop new tools that would help improve the lives of astronauts or even uh, make it more feasible to colonize new worlds? And, and, and one of my favorite questions of all time is, you know, are we alone in the universe? And presumably, if life on other worlds, if it exists, uh, if it is also nucleic acid-based, which life on Earth is can we use PCR and genetic technologies to detect its presence on a meteor on a you know on another planet? Um, so scientists have been interested for decades in sending PCR and DNA detecting technology to space uh, for many to answer many of these questions, and now we have this amazing opportunity to do it with you. Anna Sofia Bogoraev, uh, someone you may have heard on. Uh, the Genes and Space blog has uh, a lot more information about her proposal, is the 2015 Genes and Space winner. So Anna Sophia submitted her idea as a 16-year-old uh, junior in, in high school. She's from New York. Uh, and she was among the five finalists for the U.S. last year, was invited to present her proposal at the International Space Station R&D conference in Boston, where she was identified as having the best proposal of 2015. And Anna-Sophia's Anna interest is in understanding how um, immune system regulation occurs during spaceflight. So she started from a, a simple observation, maybe not simple, but uh, a fundamental observation that is during spaceflight, the immune systems of astronauts get suppressed, making them more prone to infection. And Anna-Sophia wondered if genetic changes epigenetic changes, changes to the expression of genes, could be responsible for 
the um, changes in the immune system. And, and the mechanisms are not really well understood to date. So she had a very interesting hypothesis about how epigenetic regulation could play a role. And we've worked with Anna Sophia throughout the year. It's been an amazing journey for her and for us to take that idea, uh, shape it into a real concrete experiment that could be conducted in microgravity. And um, her experiment was actually launched in April. We all went to Cape Canaveral with Anna Sophia and her family. We, we saw the, the, the launch of the rocket that took mini-PCR and Anna Sophia's experiment to the International Space Station. And amazingly, uh, only a few weeks later, uh, her experiment was actually conducted in microgravity. And here on the screen, you have astronaut Tim Peake, who carried out uh, Anna Sophia's experiment, the, the first PCR amplification in space, uh, actually congratulating Anna Sophia personally on behalf of the entire space community for her contributions to space exploration, which was a phenomenal moment for her and for, for all of us in the genes and space community. So many of you are familiar with the submissions process, but uh, we'll go through it just to clarify. Right now, uh, submissions are on hold, and the process of submission will reopen, and we'll let you all know uh, when that happens. In the meantime, you can visit the Genes in Space uh, .org website and subscribe to the newsletter through which we will also make further announcements. So submissions will reopen uh, for a period of time, and when that submissions uh, close, it when the submissions close, we will identify five finalists. So a team of uh, biologists and, and uh, space enthusiasts and scientists get together, review all the proposals in detail and identify the, the five uh, highest uh, scored submissions. We'll go through the, through the scoring guidelines in a second. And those five finalists or finalist teams, remember that you can submit alone or in groups of up to four students uh, along with an adult mentor that can be your student uh, or a parent or somebody else um, that is involved with your submission. Um, we will invite those five finalist teams to present in front of a panel of judges that includes leading uh, scientists, uh, technologists, and also educators, uh, and identify a winner that's going to be invited to fly their experiment to the International Space Station. We are very transparent on the judging criteria. Uh, the submission form itself is, is very much aligned with these criteria and very simple. We don't require that you be an expert in PCR. I mean, it would be uh, great to have a basic understanding of how PCR works and what it's used for so that you can translate that understanding into a, a space experiment. Um, but there's no expectation that you have PCR at home or in your school today. Uh, we'll make some of that available when we visit the, um, Abu Dhabi in August. Uh, but the submission is simply an essay type uh, proposal um, that you submit online. So uh, what is the question you're interested in? What is the, the fundamental problem that you're trying to address and why is that problem important is, is the first question. What's your hypothesis about that problem? Say if, you're, if the problem was uh, I want to find life beyond Earth, you know, your hypothesis might be that you presume that that life will be based on DNA as well. So based on that hypothesis, how have you thought of an experimental design that will let you test the hypothesis? And that experimental design has to include the use of PCR. Uh, and, and why is it important to conduct that experiment aboard the International Space Station? What is unique uh, about the International Space Station that will really help answer your question uh, in a way that couldn't be addressed here on Earth? Because obviously, it, it, it's, a, it's a very involved uh, it's a very involved experience to, to fly things to the International Space Station. It's a very, um, you know, uh, important resource. So we want to find really uh, meritorious ideas um, that will help advance scientific knowledge. So just as a flavor for uh, the types of ideas that real participants here in the U.S. have submitted this year on the second on the second uh, round of the competition. Uh, these are the five finalist teams that will come 
to the International Space Station uh, R&D meeting in San Diego uh, just in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have a team on the left from Massachusetts that is really interested in bacteria and how they become more virulent or, or infectious uh, in, in space. So they have a hypothesis about lateral gene transfer playing a role in making those bacteria more harmful, and we're going to hear more from them in San Diego. Uh, we have Julian from New York who's really interested in uh, why do astronauts age differently or why is there accelerated aging in space and could there be a genetic mechanism at the heart of it? And so he's going to use a technique that um, is known to be linked to aging, uh, which is measuring the length of telomeres, the end caps of chromosomes using PCR. We have Tinsum uh, from Oklahoma, uh, and he is interested in uh, how do astronauts suffer from oxidative stress? while um, on orbit, sorry, from Michigan. Um, and, and he will tell us more about developing monitoring mechanisms to protect the lives of astronauts. Uh, we have uh, a team, another team from Massachusetts looking at the reactivation of viruses in, in, during space flight. So astronauts that may be healthy uh, on Earth uh, suffer viral reactivation when they travel to space. And finally, we have a team interested in a fundamental biology question. When you travel, when you fly organisms uh, that live in, in gravity uh, and are under natural selection uh, under Earth's atmosphere, how does um, that natural selection operate differently in, a, in an environment like the International Space Station? So a really exciting set, really broad uh, topics and proposals. And uh, all these folks will get a chance to uh, go further on what they have already submitted by presenting uh, at the scientific conference in only a couple of weeks. And a similar opportunity will be extended to UAE participants once uh, finalist teams are identified. So just as a quick summary of things we've heard from Ana Sofia and other successful participants, so tips for you on where to get started. Uh, first of all, just choose a question you're passionate about. Just, you know, research the literature, think like an astronaut would. Uh, in the words of Ana Sofia, if I were an astronaut traveling to space for a, a long amount of time, what would I want there? What questions would I want to answer? So put yourself in the shoes, put on that spacesuit and think of a question that you're really passionate about. Step number two is do a lot of research. Things may already have been explored in that field that you're passionate about. Uh, you know, the Massachusetts team said we were really interested in, in, in microbes uh, on orbit and how they become more harmful. So we just went and read all the papers. So it's a great experience to, you know, then put yourself in the shoes of a, of a scientist and say, what is known in this field? And, and once you have a base understanding of what's already known, take it further. Step number three. You know, design an experiment that will, that will advance knowledge, that will move things one step further. Perhaps, you know, something that we know how things work on Earth, uh, but we don't know how they're going to behave in space. Think of the parallels and, and design an experiment that, very importantly, uses PCR. So to learn more, we are going to travel to Abu Dhabi to uh, go over some of the genes and space ideas, but also get hands-on with DNA technology and with PCR directly. Uh, so we're going to offer this opportunity to, uh, to, to a set of, of teachers and students. And if you are interested in joining us in Abu Dhabi on August 22nd, uh, please email this email address on the screen right now, genesinspace at the national dot AE. Um, you know, it's going to be a limited... Um, set of people who are going to get access to this opportunity. So please, please let us know of your interest well ahead of time uh, and let us know whether you are a teacher or a student and where you are located today. Details about the workshop itself will be forthcoming. So we're coming towards the end of the presentation and we're going to leave a few minutes for questions. We just want to uh, remind you again uh, that this is a phenomenal opportunity. We're very excited to be sharing it uh, with you, and we can't wait to read 
what experiments you want to conduct aboard the International Space Station. And remember that this is uh, for, uh, in the U.S. system, uh, the equivalent of grade 7 through 12 in, in middle school and high school. Um, and you can submit as a single student or in teams of up to four. You cannot participate in more than one team. This question has come up. Can I, you know, submit one idea with one team and then participate in another team? Choose your best idea, put your best foot forward, and submit that uh, single idea. Here are some resources uh, to take this further. I know that it's very hard to take all this information in, but all of these resources are also available at the Genes in Space website, genesinspace.org. Uh, go to the top menu and look for the Learn tab where you're going to find more information about uh, polymerase chain reaction technology and about the resources available aboard the International Space Station uh, such as, you know, what other scientific instruments are available in that lab? Um, you know, what types of experiments, biotech-related experiments, have already been carried out and are being carried out uh, today? And just generally learn more about the engineering of the International Space Station, its habitat, um, the capabilities on the lab, and, and what types of things are feasible in that environment. So. With that, uh, we want to leave you with our contact information. Uh, this event was uh, sponsored and organized by uh, the Boeing and Mini PCR teams that are part of the Genes in Space competition. Uh, a huge thank you to our colleagues at Boeing for enabling uh, this, this webinar and the, and the technology platform before, behind the webinar. Uh, thank you, Houston. And uh, this is the contact information for the Genes and Space team, genes and space at minipcr.com. Um, we welcome your, your questions uh, now. Um, folks, if you, if you have questions, feel free to just say them directly. Uh, sorry, we're getting, we're getting a question here um, for the chat. Thank you, Arnav Ghosh. Uh, I was, the question is, I was wondering if we need a similar level of understanding for the analysis of the multiplied DNA sequence. So, great question. Um, you know, the analysis of the sequence post-PCR uh, will be done on Earth um, for the genes and space experiment. And there, you know, we will have access to electrophoresis technology as well as to sequencing. And as Zeke alluded to, um, these are the two most fundamental ways of analyzing PCR uh, outputs. One, sequencing will give you the detailed string of bases that made up that genetic sequence that you just amplified, so the ACs, Gs, and Ts, so that um, you can fully decode that uh, PCR product. Electrophoresis, on the other hand, is a technique that allows for separation of the PCR products based on size and their mass. So it's going to provide uh, other type of information complementary to, to the sequence. For more detail about these techniques, there are plenty of resources available online, uh, some of which are on the Learn tab of genesandspace.org. But feel free to also email us for more direct uh, links to these, to these technologies. And we are going to use electrophoresis at the hands-on workshop in Abu Dhabi on August 22nd. Um, Arnab, does that answer your question? Yeah, and I just wanted to add that you don't need to become an expert, uh, as Sebastian said, the same as with PCR. No, you need to get an idea, as no, not, not a lot more than we just talked about. Um, and um, the, the more important thing is that your, your proposal is a strong proposal that you've you know, thought through all the steps. Um, if you become one of the finalists, we will help you understand all of these in, in more detail and how you might apply it to your specific experiment. So, um, again, don't worry about becoming an expert in all the technology side and uh, things. Just think about your idea and you know, do the research uh, to, to, to put together a strong proposal. Um, we have... Um Another question, uh, can we submit an entirely new idea for the resubmission? 
So the short answer is yes. If you are a current contestant and based on further research and, and more knowledge of PCR and space, you have come up with an entirely new idea, um, yes, when submissions reopen, uh, you, your new idea will be, will be welcome. We will dismiss the original proposal. Um, there's another question from Purna on what is going to happen um, on the 22nd of August at the workshop. It is going to be an all-day workshop at, um, at an academic institution where we will do two things. We will share genes in space, um, the history of it, the scientific basis for it, uh, the DNA technology behind it, the capabilities on the space station, very similar to uh, what we've done on this webinar, but we'll also take it further. We will invite you to brainstorm ideas uh, directly with us um, that can be the basis for your future submission so that um, we can all think about space exploration topics together. And in the afternoon, we will engage in a hands-on experiment that simulates a situation that astronauts may encounter uh, and where they might need PCR technology. And that's a, an outbreak of uh, foodborne illness aboard the International Space Station. So it's a hands-on experiment that uses PCR and gel electrophoresis to solve a real problem in space. Uh, Aaron has a question. Can we submit the same idea uh, with alterations? So, uh, Yes, you can modify your original idea. Uh, and again, if you resubmit, um, we will disregard your, your original submission and only judge your, your most current version. And that is very much encouraged. We hope that you will have taken advantage of this, um, of this pause in the competition to enrich your knowledge and, and, and get, you know, go a little bit further. Um, Another question, can the student get the feedback before making alterations so that changes can be made accordingly? Thanks, Srividya, for the question. Um, unfortunately, we cannot provide feedback on the content of the submission before you actually submit. Um, if you are chosen as one of the finalists, you get to work with a PhD mentor from either Harvard or MIT where you can further refine your proposal, but that is only after the finalist selection is made. So. Feedback will not be provided to submissions that are made online. An important part of the process um, is once finalists are identified, uh, we appoint volunteer mentors to each of the finalist teams. And these are real scientists uh, working at Harvard or MIT in biomedical research and, and interested in space who will actually accompany the five finalist teams in refining their original submissions and, and make them even more uh, detailed and, and, and ready for space flight. So that is a phenomenal learning opportunity for the, for the students involved to work alongside uh, a real scientist from MIT or Harvard. So there's this one uh, other question from Bella. Are applications beyond space equally important in terms of grading and submission? Um, so the answer is those are great uh, ideas, but for, for genes in space, we actually want to think, um, you know, what is important in space. So uh, as we showed during the presentation, the fourth and actually the, the question that gives most points is we really need a, a good uh, reason for be doing this in the space station. If you think you can do that experiment on Earth without any problem, then no, that might be a great idea, but not what we're looking for in this competition. We want to think about space and how we can advance you know, space exploration and science in space. So we really want you to think um, about astronauts and, and about you know, life outside Earth, things that we cannot do here on Earth. We have another great question from Rushika. Um, can the experiment be about other organisms beyond uh, humans? And I'm just going to dial back to the five finalist teams uh, from, from this year's U U.S. competition to see the, the breadth of experimental organisms that, that they have chosen. So the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, very often in, in medical research, using a model organism, 
uh, makes a fundamental question easier to, to, to address. So uh, the team on the left is interested in studying bacteria and how they may share genetic material in space that ultimately poses a challenge to humans because it makes these bacteria more harmful. Uh, Julian is interested in telomeres. A great uh, model organism to study telomeres is, is the roundworm, sorry, um, the worm C. elegans. And, and, and Zeke, uh, our genetics are in that. So, um, yes, the, the, the answer is um, a model organism can be very helpful in, in getting the, the first step in answering a question. Anna Sophia actually used a zebrafish DNA in her first experiment, uh, aiming to understand changes, epigenetic changes in space. If I had two ideas, can I do both? Um, thanks for the question. I, um, no, unfortunately, you cannot. If you, um, we're requesting um, students to only submit one idea. You can submit it as an individual, or you can submit it in teams of up to four. If you have already submitted, as we said, you may change your idea, and the submission that you have in fall will count as a new submission, and we will um, void the submission that you had before. But you may not submit two ideas in the fall that both uh, would be counted as a submission. Um, would it be looked upon more favorably to have an open-ended experiment as opposed to, uh, to one that addresses a more particular problem? This is, this is, this is a great question, not an easy one to answer. Um, the, the judging team is a team of, of, of several scientists and goes through a very rigorous process to identify the best ideas. Uh, the, the judging team is open to both types of ideas. And again, going to this year's finalists, the team at the bottom is trying to answer a fundamental basic biology question. What, how does natural selection operate in an environment very different from, one, uh, from the one on Earth um, without really being interested in a practical solution to a, you know, w w with, a, with a clear cut outcome. This may become fundamental to study what, you know, to understand what happens to living organisms on Earth, but, but the real fundamental question is how does genetic drift occur in microgravity? Um, that is very different from the team from Massachusetts on the, on the top right that is interested in very specifically understanding viral reactivation because this may pose a direct challenge to the lives of astronauts. We've had other submissions that are very similarly problem focused and, and looking for solutions and, and we really welcome both. We're really excited uh, you know to hear what you guys are are, are thinking about. Yeah, and to add to that, um, there's one question um, specifically for the application about the design of the experiment, the experimental design. So we want you to think if, if your idea is very broad, how you would actually turn that into one experiment. Um, and that experiment could be the beginning um, of understanding that problem that you're proposing. It doesn't have to you know, answer it completely because you know, many times we need many experiments to answer a question, but we do want you to think about, I have this big idea, how do I turn this into an experiment? Not just leave it at the idea stage, but we want you to think, you know, how would I go about testing this? So we're, we're approaching the end of time, and we love your enthusiasm, and you know, we encourage you to continue to submit uh, questions offline later if, if we haven't answered all of them here, and we'll look forward to meeting many of you in Abu Dhabi. We have time for one more question, and um, Pritvik is asking whether animals can be used uh, for testing in the experiment, and uh, how will we handle um, you know, ethical issues around the treatment of animals. So, uh, research aboard the International Space Station adheres to all guidelines and universally recognized guidelines on the humane treatment of animals. Uh, if you're looking to use a model organism, it can always be helpful to visit the resources uh, that we've pointed to. They're also on the Genes in Space website about what types of uh, model organisms have been available or can be available aboard the International Space Station so that it can inform your choice. And, and yes, um, be assured that you know, the final experimental design. This is not something that you personally need to worry about right now on how to design the experiment to adhere to these guidelines, but the finalist experiment is going to work very closely with the Genes and Space team to ensure adherence to, um, to any animal research guidelines.
Yeah, and going on, going forward, if you have more questions, uh, uh, no technical questions uh, or scientific questions, uh, feel free to email them at the email uh, genesinspace uh, at minipcr.com. No, we'll get back to you with, with the answers. So thank you all for uh, being here with us today. Uh, we had a good time. I hope it was a, a useful session. Um, again, going forward, any questions directed to us? And we look forward to seeing you very soon in Abu Dhabi. Thanks very much, everyone.